Here was I, in the midst of a vast continent that was invisible to me though I felt it all around. A desolate paradise, far too immense for my legs. America existed for no one, if not for me. But it existed only in my needs, my desires, and my fears. Hey everybody, thank you as always for watching Leaf by Leaf today. I'm excited to talk about Antonio Di Benedetto's book, Zama, and the 2017 film adaptation from Lucretia Martel. You should really listen up or perhaps just go ahead and buy the book right away because this is Argentinian literature. For me, Latin American, South American, Spanish language, Argentinian, Chilean, Mexican, Portuguese, Brazilian, Spanish, Peruvian. All this literature of Latin America seems to have a, an intensity and a beauty that you just can't really get anywhere else in the world. Antonio Di Benedetto had three major champions rooting for him in his literature. Jorge Borges, Julio Cortazar, and Roberto Bolaño. Borges talked about how much the pages of Di Benedetto moved him and continued to move him. And Bolaño referred to Zama as executed with the steadiness of a neurosurgeon. As the preface by the translator Esther Allen tells us, Benedetto was very in debt to, Benedetto, eh, there could have been a pun there, he was in debt to none other than Dostoyevsky. In fact, he went so far as to say Dostoyevsky invented Benedetto. Esther Allen also draws one of those freaky literary coincidences where Dostoyevsky, of course, faced the mock firing squad before he wrote his big book, but Benedetto would face his own firing squad and be executed about two decades after Zama. In this book, we follow the titular character, Don Diego de Zama. He is the corredor or magistrate of a little colony there in South America. I think it's either Paraguay or Uruguay. This is our first big element of the book's themes, that is colonialism. So Zama works high up as a magistrate for this colony for the royal Spanish crown, and he is ever awaiting a transfer, a promotion, and a transfer to be closer to where his wife and children and mother live in Buenos Aires. But sort of like Beckett's Waiting for Godot, this never happens. And as the story unfolds across its three parts, which each skip about four to five years in between, we can watch the disillusionment set in. And even in the film, this is physically portrayed to us with a Zama that looks increasingly worn down and haggard. But at least for the opening part, what keeps Zama going is his lascivious liaisons and concupiscent capers, furtive flirtations. Indeed, his fleshly desires preside over the entire first part of the novel. As we move into the second part, there's a complete change in tone. In fact, the very first part, which is sort of youthful and, like I said, given over to fleshly desires and hope in this future transfer, the prose has a suppleness. It's very light of foot. And all these sexual acts or pursuits, I should say, because they're not all fulfilled, teeter back and forth between an aggressiveness and a clumsiness that bespeaks the folly of youth. To be honest, with the first section, which is about 97 pages, I started to get a little bored with it. But then in the final page of the first section, it sort of wakes the reader up to a serious reality that is tucked away inside of Zama. Something deep inside me canceled out these promising external perspectives or fleshly desires. I saw everything before me in good order, possible, realized or realizable. Nevertheless, it was as if I myself might generate failure. Not that I judged myself guilty of this failure. It was as if the guilt were an inheritance and had little to do with me. I was equipped with a kind of advance resignation. 
everything is possible, I saw, and in the end, every possibility can be exhausted. This sort of has that futility and despair of Coalette, the author of Ecclesiastes, where he ended up denying himself no pleasure, yet he exhausted the possibilities of everything under the sun. It wasn't the mere fact of transience that concerned me. Much can be made of what is fleeting, the moment enjoyed for the moment, which is how he's basically been getting by over these early years away from his family in the colony. The cause of my overwhelming unease was something greater. I knew not what, a kind of potent negation, invisible to the eye, that was superior to any strength I might muster or rebellion I might wage. What was more, it threatened from afar. At present, every prospect seemed favorable, but I suspected another irremediable phase, far off, imminent, that I would reach in exhaustion, as if extinguished in the depths of a void. So you see here, we're talking about negation and void. This is where you can see the influence of the existentialism of Dostoevsky coming out here with Zama through Benedetto. I sought an explanation for my turmoil and became aware that it was as if I had, for a great while, been approaching some long foreseen design, which I think is key, that I was now within. So that to me would be him confronting determinism and the disillusionment of free will being shattered. He realizes that there was a foreordained design and he's caught right in the web of it. I felt an imperious need to grasp hold of something. My stomach demanded nourishment came to my aid. I went to the inn as if in pursuit of hope. So once again, that asserts for me that this first section is given over to the flesh because his bodily desires, even in the form of being hungry, suppress this existential malaise that's been bubbling up. And it seems to be the absence of surprise or serendipity that's weighing most heavily on his spirit. Right off the bat, in the opening pages of the second section, we have definitely left the lusty, youthful pleasures of his life. And we're moving now from the body to the mind. And right off the bat, we get Zama ruminating on God and mankind and coming to conclusions such as that mankind created a multitude of gods who did not look kindly upon the first one. He could see man, that first god, but man could not see him. It's very much in the vein of some of the Jewish mysticism that I talked about in my Olga Tokarczuk video. Eventually, he stirs himself out of what he calls his private theogony. At this point, there's further disillusionment. Governors are coming and going, a new governor all the time. The only thing that doesn't change is the fact that for Zama, nothing changes. And he gets moved to these temporary quarters in this strange part of the colony where now we start to get something in the book akin to Henry James's A Turn of the Screw. There's this ghostliness that starts to come in and there's some just weird, strange stuff that takes place that unfortunately was omitted from the film. But, you know, two hour movie can't capture everything that's even in a 200 page book. We're continuing to see here in late 18th century South America, in this royal Spanish colony, we're seeing more of the racism, the sexism, hierarchism, status, and superstition. The movie does a great job with its beautiful set design and costumes and casting of showing this mix of Americanos and the indigenous tribes who are now enslaved, though some are what they call the Indians who are native and dangerous. You've also got the Spaniards who are the top of the food chain. And then you've got people like Zama who is part of Spain, the Spanish empire, and high up in their military hierarchy or governmental hierarchy, yet he was born in South America. So there's a clash of identities everywhere that the film does a beautiful job of presenting. As the second and third and final parts of the book started to unfold, 
my expectations were constantly upended. I kept thinking I knew where this book was going and then it would turn me on my head, which is really amusing considering the fact that Antonio Di Benedetto has a dedication page where he says that this book is to the victims of expectation. At one point, Zama says, it did cause me pain, considerable pain to reflect that reality continually eluded my grasp. And that if a woman came to me, she did so in my dreams and nowhere else. He ends up getting sick while he's in this temporary residence and the native woman with whom he has had an illegitimate child and thus has no heir for the lineage and promises by the Spanish crown in the government work is taking care of him now along with his assistant Fernandez who falls in love with Emilia. As he's in these throes from the sickness and the fever, coupled with all of these ghostly encounters that he has, there is an ambiguity that starts to really take hold in the book. And at one point, Zama acknowledges everything was far too ambiguous, but the ambiguity did not appear to be hers. It seemed rather to emanate from me, as if this feminine figure beside me were not real, but only a projection of my afflicted consciousness, a projection made flesh by the magic power of creation that fever possesses. And that magic power of creation is also brought out in the character of Fernandez. And when one of the governors comes to the colony and finds out that Fernandez is actually working on his own book, writing his own book, he gets upbraided. And the governor says, you should be making children, not books. Books are worthless. I'm so thankful that this was left in to the movie because Fernandez's responses are great. He says, I don't know how children will be, but I know what this book will be. In other words, he's the master of and controller of his fate when it comes to the book versus propagating human beings. And then he pointedly says, I have no master when I work on a book. And so you can feel Di Benedetto, the author behind the veil of the story, proclaiming that, hey, for me, when I'm writing this book, I'm completely free of this existential malaise. If the first part of the book represents the flesh and the second part of the book represents the spirit. The third part actually represents oblivion, but with a glimmer of hope given at the end of both the book and more so in the movie. So we get to grow up with Zama over these 10, 15 or so years. It's not unlike what Joyce did in his collection Dubliners, where you progress through the stories from youth and, and childhood all the way to death. But in this book's case, and in Zama's mind, he proclaims, to cease to exist did not trouble me. He's ready to face the void. He's ready for oblivion. But, I said to myself, it would be terrible to cry out in pain or fear in the throes of death with no one there to hear. So it's his fear of being alone or dying alone that is one of the roots of this malaise. Kind of like Tyrone Slothrop in Gravity's Rainbow, Zama is <laughs> increasingly atrophied and entropied throughout the book. He doesn't quite get dissipated as Slothrop does, but he gets physically dismembered nonetheless. Towards the end, Zama says, I asked myself not why I was alive, but why I had lived. Out of expectation, I supposed, and wondered whether I still expected anything. It seemed I did. Something more is always expected. My thinking mind had this thought, but when I dispensed with thinking, I fell into a brute inertia. So again, flesh to brain or mind or thinking. Now we've dispensed with that and we move into what I consider oblivion and he says brute inertia as if my share in things were running out and the world would be left unpopulated because I would no longer exist within it, which gives us another special form of existentialism in the manner of solipsism. It's a book that makes you ask yourself, is the imagination really greater than reality or do we simply have the wrong expectations? The movie by the Argentinian director, she also did the screenplay adaptation, Lucretia Martel, is 
gorgeous. I have to say it though, I did read the book first. I'm always going to do that. And I try to put the book out of my mind while I'm watching the film adaptation, but it was very difficult because the book had a major impact on me. Like I said, please, if you start reading this, read through to the end of the first part, which is 97 pages, because it progresses into the second and then third and final parts. And it's like a totally different book. But that first part really dwells on his follies there in the colony and being led about by his flesh and these games back and forth between him and the different women there. And in the essence of time and having to be selective for a film, a lot of that is completely skipped over. Like I said, the filming location, the set design, the costumes, the blending of all these different cultures together to bring the 18th century colonialized South America to life is stunning. Zama is a striking character in his tan tricorn hat, his wine red jacket, and his curved rapier. There's a sparse and dreamy score that especially highlights the flights of fancy and sinking inwardness of Zama. But again, the cat and mouse games between Zama and Lucretia are largely cut out. They give us just enough to get the point of the fact that this is a thwarted desire. The ghostly surreal encounters and some of the most bizarre scenes are left out. And to be honest, I was just thinking if I hadn't read the book, I think a lot of the movie would be lost on me because there were things that were subtly hinted that I don't think I would have picked up on. But then again, I'm not attuned to taking in films as I am with books. Daniel Jimenez Cacho does a wonderful job of Zama. He keeps this intense, almost pained face the entire film. Lola Duenez as Luciana, wonderful. I do wish, however, that we would have gotten more of Malimba's character played by Mariana Numez. There's a lot more attention given to Vicuña Porto, who is this sort of notorious outlaw, this mythologized fiend. Right from the beginning, his name is on everyone's lips. And I have to say that the actor who played this character looked like he was channeling the young Jack Nicholson with some of his sinister looks and just the shape of his head and, and the furrow of his brow. As with most books and their film adaptations, I wish I could sort of split myself in two so that I could experience each of them on their own without the influence of another. But I think what I'll do is I'll give it some time and I'll go back and watch the film again. Just on the audiovisual stimulation level, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous film. If you like Camus, if you like Sartre, Dostoevsky, why not give Antonio Di Benedetto a try? Start with Zama. Wonderful book from NYRB.